The January transfer window is about to open here in our realistic Norwich City career mode. We had a relatively busy summer in the end, letting go of the likes of Gabby Sara and Angus Gunn, whilst we brought in a good mix of youth and experience in the form of Tiano Ballo, Marius Wolf, Callum Chambers, Harry Toffolo, and Jason Steele. I hadn't planned on doing much business in January, but unfortunately, it looks like our hand has been forced. Johannes Thorup has made a good impression on the vast majority of the squad, but two players who haven't taken kindly to the new manager are Jack Stacey and Grant Hanley. Each of those players have officially handed in a transfer request, and Grant Hanley has even already secured a move up to Scotland to join Rangers. So if nothing else, we'll have to bring in some additional depth along the back line to cover for those departures. News reports suggest that Grant Hanley's conversation with his new manager was a respectful one and he will continue to lead the side for the month of December. However, sources suggest that Jack Stacey blew up at Johannes Thorup on the training pitch after the arrival of Marius Wolf means that he's pretty much lost his place in the first team. And with so many games to get to, not only this month, but over the course of the second half of the season, Jack Stacey likely would have got his opportunities to prove himself. We've got six games to get to today, starting with a featured game against West Bromwich Albion at the Hawthorns. I'll be bringing you highlights of our home fixture against Hull, as well as our trip down to Plymouth. And we'll be simulating games against Cardiff City, Bristol City, and Sunderland at the Stadium of Light. West Brom are just four points behind us in the championship table, so should prove to be a pretty stern test, especially away from home. So we are going to set up slightly differently in this one. West Brom will line up in a 4-2-3-1. Josh Madger up front, Jonathan Swift in the number 10, and a strong midfield behind them, including Moa, Yokozlai, Wallace, and Phillips. Whereas Johannes Thorup is going to go with a 4-3-3 today. Jason Steele in goal, a back four of Wolf, Chambers, Hanley the captain, and Toffolo. McLean, Nunez, and Liam Gibbs gets a rare start in midfield. Borja Sainz starts on the left, Johnny Rowe on the right, Josh Sargent starts up front. So a pretty familiar 11, but it's tactically where we're going to differ. So we're going to line up in a 4-3-3, but with a single pivot today rather than our usual double pivot. I think that will give us a really good shape to counteract what West Brom are looking to do. So we're going to line up with our usual back four, but today Kenny McLean is going to be the single player at CDM with Liam Gibbs and Marcelino Nunez either side. Like Graham Potter's old Brighton sides, we're looking to employ the same tactics. It's just the shape of the team that will be different. So we're looking to achieve the same things going forward that we always do. That means having Kenny McLean sit back to provide additional cover for the back line, having our fullbacks get high and wide up the field to allow the likes of Johnny Rowe and Borja Sainz to double up on the West Brom fullbacks. Now that's going to create a dilemma for West Brom because they either need to decide that they're going to bring their wide players back to help support or they're going to have to leave their fullbacks exposed. And as we can see in the pre-match report, defensively, West Brom are going to look to defend with a low block. So I imagine they're going to bring their wide player back. That's going to create a pretty neutral game state with each of our attackers being accounted for by a West Brom defender. But if we can generate some good off the ball movement, and pass the ball quickly, we should be able to open up some gaps in behind. Defensively, I think this is where this particular system is really going to shine. The main reason we're playing with the single pivot today is to completely neutralize Jonathan Swift in that number 10 role. We're going to have Kenny McLean not only stay back while attacking, but actually man mark Jonathan Swift, so completely take him out of the game. Like West Brom, we'll pretty much be left man for man elsewhere, but with two center backs to double up, on the West Brom striker. So again, it's going to create a pretty neutral game state. So I think this is going to be a pretty tight KG affair and the team that's better on the ball is going to win out and I'm backing that to be us. So without further ado, let's head over to the Hawthorns and hope this game plays out as we expect. So we are up in the commentary box at the Hawthorns on a cold and frosty December afternoon. Feels like December has come around awfully quickly, which means the January transfer window is going to be coming around awfully quickly. I don't really have any targets in mind at the moment, despite having been scouting since the very beginning of the season. As West Brom look to get off to a quick start here through Wallace down their right-hand side. And it's a good block from Grant Hanley to prevent Phillips 
from getting a shot on goal early. It's actually Chambers who comes across to make the block. Hanley there as well. Hanley, unfortunately, requesting a transfer away from Caro Road. Like Angus Gunn, not a player I was intending to sell, but... When a player puts in a transfer request, there's, there's really very little you can do to prevent them from leaving. Comfortable save from Jason Steele. A bright start to the game, though, from West Brom. So we will have to look to replace Grant Hanley in January. I'm not entirely sure which way I want to go about doing that, though. Do we want to bring in a player? Good challenge, Marcelino Nunez. Johnny Rowe. Bit of space on the edge of the box. Strikes from range. It's blocked by a West Brom defender. Gibbs wins the header, though. Chance for Johnny Rowe to turn another shot towards goal, which again is blocked. And this game a little more open than I was expecting in these opening five or ten minutes. We don't really have the budget to bring in a permanent replacement for Grant Hanley. At least on a on a permanent deal in January we could potentially I mean there's two ways we can go about it really we can bring in an incredibly cheap experienced centre back pretty much just to play for us for six months and then just be depth we can bring in a a slightly better calibre of player but on loan for the remainder of the season or we could bring in a player on a loan to buy deal so somebody who we are looking to make a Norwich City player not just for the remainder of this season but beyond we don't have the money to secure that kind of player outright in January but a loan to buy deal certainly could be an option That's an ambitious ball from Borja Sainz to try and find Harry Toffolo. Got a little too much on it. I'm really enjoying Borja Sainz on the left-hand side. We've been very much experimenting with that three behind Josh Sargent this season. And Borja Sainz is impressed really wherever he's played. I would say he's been our best of those attacking options. But I do think he looks best coming off the left-hand side. Which I would say probably is, is the same as in real life. That is his best position in real life. He's looked good in the number 10 role this season as well, though. He's looked perfectly fine off the right-hand side. But I think we get the most out of Borja Science on the left. And I think Johnny Rowe is, is more than capable on the right-hand side. And I think Tiano Ballo is going to be our, our number 10 after all. Here's another player that we've moved around a lot. Unsure what his best position is at the moment. But I think we will pursue him in the number 10. Since Rowe and Sainz have pretty much locked down those wide positions. It's kind of process of elimination at this point. West Brom moving the ball really nicely. I said in the build-up to the game that whichever team is better on the ball whichever team is able to generate the best off the ball movement move the ball quicker is going to be the team that will end up winning this game and at the moment it's been West Brom so we need to look to really match the tempo and the style that West Brom have created early Borja sights in at the back post can't quite get his head on it Harry Toffolo might get there the West Brom defender gets there first. And Kenny McLean is not anywhere near tight enough to Jonathan Swift. We put him on that man mark instruction so that he would be pretty much touch tight to Swift the entire game. Because Swift is such an attacking threat. Such a dynamic player. But he had about 10 yards of space from Kenny McLean on that particular occasion. Good challenge, Grant Hanley. And Borja Sites could be away. Furlong gets back recovers well Furlong once more bit of pressure now from Sites and from Sargent nice little touch from Kelly to take it away from danger though Kelly once more Sargent and Sites each again applying the pressure good challenge from Sites 
The game has played out pretty much as we were expecting so far. And I mean, West Brom do have some quality players in their side. Certainly for the championship level anyway. So the fact that they've had a brighter start is nothing to be ashamed of exactly. We do need to establish some control though. We've been good defensively, but we have lacked any real impetus or dynamism going forward. And we're 25 minutes into the game and I can't really remember having created an opportunity almost of any kind. A couple of crosses that we've put into the box that have been dealt with fairly comfortably by West Brom. And again, West Brom are working the ball into a good position here. Swift, Kenny McLean and Callum Chambers each back there to deal with the danger. Kenny McLean gives the ball straight back to West Brom though. And we are pretty fortunate to still be in possession of the ball here. Big switch of play is on. Both Toffolo and Seitz. In a position to cause a threat on the counter-attack. Referee blows his whistle though. One by Josh Madger. Wallace. Down the West Brom right. Just relays the ball to Furlong who is getting forward. From that deep position at right back and it's potentially something we can exploit with the likes of Borja Sainz Liam Gibbs finds Chambers finds the feet of Johnny Rowe he's going to cut inside and allow Marius Wolf to overlap instead it's a nice little reverse pass to Marcelino Nunez which doesn't quite come off and West Brom could be about to do exactly what I was hoping we would be able to do just moments ago, and that is exploit us down one of those vacated flanks. Various Wolf high up the field. And West Brom take the lead. And I believe it's Phillips. It's not Phillips. It's Swift. Of course it is. Kenny McLean nowhere to be seen. Jonathan. Why can I not say Jonathan Swift? Jonathan Swift... Gives West Brom the lead. Far too much space in the penalty area. I literally can't even see Kenny McLean. I have no idea where he is. So, I mean... In theory... I feel like these tactics should be working. But, of course, as a coach, there's only so much you can do. You do need the players to go out and execute the tactics that you've agreed upon. And at the moment, it seems as though Kenny McLean is not doing that by any means. He is not man-marking Jonathan Swift. He's not even really staying back in attack because... He wasn't even in the frame there on any of those replays. Swift again causing issues. Callum Chambers the closest to him this time and it's only a very very good save from Jason Steele that keeps us in this game because a 2-0 deficit by half time would have been incredibly difficult to come back from here at the Hawthorns and it's another save by Jason Steele. This time a comfortable one is near post and he is absolutely incensed with his defenders. Really poor defensive display so far and it's again Jonathan Swift, this time turning the ball towards goal with his head. Harry Toffolo, a, a really weak defensive effort. He did actually get something on it though, so I kind of take that back to some degree. And the West Brom man just allows the ball to go out of play. Harry Toffolo's clearance again. Gives West Brom yet another corner. Near post this time where Jonathan Rowe will head clear. Nicely worked, but blocked by a Norwich City man. And Borja Sainz is going to have to carry the ball up the field. Liam Gibbs just stops his run. Stops his run at an inopportune moment, to say the least. Really well worked by Harry Toffolo, though. And we need to generate some sort of momentum before we go into this second half. And that is not the way to do it. I think things are going to have to change at half-time. The system is, is not working either defensively or going forward. 
Defensively, I, I feel like we've been fairly solid. But Kenny McLean has just not been a factor at all defensively. And we really needed him to be a factor if this system was going to keep West Brom off the scoreboard. But going forward, we just have absolutely nothing to offer at the moment. And that, I think, is, since we are a goal down, what most needs to change going into the second half is Harry Toffolo. I think Kenny McLean has just been completely neutralised. Both defensively and going forward. Because he is just taking up positions kind of just beyond the back four to try and collect the ball. But he is all but obsolete there. Borja Sainz. Very few options on for Borja Sainz. And it is going to be a Norwich City free kick. Which Kenny McLean will deliver. Perhaps he can make an impact here just before the break. It was a decent enough ball into the box. Callum Chambers wins the header. It's Josh Sargent. Bit of space. Too many West Brom defenders in the way. Far too many. There was eight or nine bodies that shot had to get through. If it was going to test the goalkeeper. It didn't get through the first. Borja Sainz. Oh, it's a heavy, heavy touch. We had a real opportunity there to put West Brom on the back foot. Sainz's touch was just too heavy. Marius Wolf driving towards the West Brom box. And Josh Sargent is just taking up a position on the corner of the penalty area. We just needed him just to, to belt it towards the six-yard box there. And he just... Really, really poor performance. And I feel like everything about that first half performance was... was was diabolical to be honest poor decisions like Josh Sargent at the very end there players just absolutely go missing like Kenny McLean the tactics not playing out as we were hoping either big big changes need to take place for the second half thank you for checking out this episode of our realistic Norwich City career mode if you're enjoying the content make sure you leave a like and if you want to see more content like this in the future make sure you hit that subscribe button we're approaching the end of the FC 24 cycle now but there'll be plenty more content to come with the release of FC 25 including 12th man memberships if you want to get more involved with the channel check out the membership tiers on my homepage. memberships start at less than two pounds per month and come with a whole host of benefits and rewards, including you being able to feature in my career mode saves. We'll be starting a road to glory with a created club as soon as FC25 drops. So if you want to be included in the save or even feature in our starting 11, become a 12th man member of the channel today. 12th man members also get exclusive early access to all of my videos, not only my career mode series, but also my realistic slider sets and everything else in between. If you want more information about exactly what each tier involves, be sure to check out this video on my homepage. If memberships aren't for you, you can also join the public area of my Discord server or just keep watching and enjoying the content for free right here on YouTube. As always, I appreciate all of your encouragement and support. Now, let's get back to the video. So yeah, Hannes Thorup has made big, big changes coming out for the second half. Two substitutions, Kenny McLean and Liam Gibbs each leaving the field. Tiano Balo on to replace one of those two players. Adam Eder on to replace the other. Johnny Rowe, bit of space. Curling shot towards the near post. And I thought that was in for a moment. I think some of the Norwich City fans just behind the goal there thought that was in for a moment as well. And there's a handball. Johannes Thorpin sensed that there's no penalty for that handball. It does go out for a Norwich City corner though, which Marcelino Nunez will deliver. Just charging in the box, wins the header and it's cleared off the line. Maris Wolf puts it back in and West Bromwich Albion hook clear. This is exactly the start we were looking for for the second half though. Adam Eder, the second substitute to enter the fray here for the second half. And we have switched to a 4-4-2 for this one. So both Josh Sargent and Adam Eder will be playing up front. Tiano Ballo pairing with 
Marcelino Nunez in midfield. Johnny Rowe and Borja Sainz, the wide players. And we are obviously looking to get back level as early as possible here in the second half. And we are going to have to throw caution to the wind a little more to try and make that happen, I think. It was a... And a, a tepid, tepid first half. A really poor performance. We just had so little to offer going forward. And we had no real answer for West Brom defensively. Even if we were relatively comfortable for most of that first half defensively. That's a really poor pass. Marius Wolf just about keeps it in. And it is going to be a Norris City throw. Sieno Ballo's pass was not great. By any means, though. And look how deep West Brom are defending. We're going to have to do a, a really good job to break them down here in the second half. Adam Eder. Borja Sainz tries to deliver but blocked. I imagine there's going to be a, a booking for the West Brom man next time the play stops. Because that was an extremely late challenge on Tiano Ballo. The thing about this 4-4-2 as well is that we do have... No, he was never offside. The West Brom man does get his booking, Alex Mowat. We do have two target men in the box now as well, in Adam Eder and Josh Sargent. So, working the ball down the flanks, getting some crosses into the box. Could be a way to exploit West Brom here in the second half. And I didn't even see where that ball was. I think Johnny Rowe got something of it. Grant Handley trying to stop the cross manages to do that Harry Toffolo now back in position and puts in a really good challenge and again it's going to be a Norris City throw which Johnny Rowe will collect and drive forward from a defensive position Josh Madger trying to cause Johnny Rowe issues oh we needed that far more on that pass from Marius Wolf. I did power it up more, but because he hit it first time, that's really well worked. Josh Sargent, can we get the ball to him? Yes, we can. Josh Sargent all alone. Can he finish? Yes, he can. Josh Sargent equalises for Norwich City. And it's taken us 15 minutes into this second half to grab a goal. And I think we press on and try and grab the win now because we have looked much, much better in these 15 minutes than we did in the 45 before the break. We're going to have to be wary. We're going to have to be vigilant defensively to make sure that we don't concede the lead to West Brom again. But right in front, front of those travelling Norwich fans. Josh Sargent, 12th goal of the season, I believe. Grabs the equaliser. And we have the impetus now. We have the momentum. We have the will to go on and win this game. It's going to take a lot. I think West Brom are going to continue to cause us issues here in the second half. Adam Eder steals the ball away, though. Really poor pass from the West Brom man. And Tiano Ballo is running backwards. Why are you running back towards your own goal there? Especially since I'm pressing the, the run button. I'm pressing LB to try and generate an off-the-ball run. Even though that's what he should be doing anyway in that situation. I mean, why you would ever run back towards your own goal in that situation, I have no idea. Really good challenge. Siano Ballo, though. Does well just to hold on to the ball as well. Through the West Brom press. Marius Wolf on this right-hand side. Josh Sargent makes a nice run into the channel. Wolf finds him. Borja Sainz. Maris Wolf once more. Delivers first time. Johnny Rowe is in there. But headed clear by West Brom. I was hoping we would find Adam Eder somewhere near the back post. Maris Wolf once more into a crossing position. Twisting, turning, beating his man. Keeping the ball in play. Chipping towards the back post. Couldn't quite find Adam Eder. Tiano Ballo forces a good save from Palmer, the West Brom goalkeeper. And it is hooked clear. 
Thiago Ballard can't quite steal the ball away. Callum Chambers, however, can. What a challenge that is. Adam Eder. Johnny Rowe splits the West Brom defenders. What a save. And Johnny Rowe puts it out for a throw-in. I'd already pressed B to try and get the, uh, the first-time rebound. But then Johnny Rowe took a touch. So I just flicked the left stick in the opposite direction. I couldn't quite get my thumb to A in time to cancel the shot. Johnny Rowe put it out for a throw. Couple of really good opportunities there to take the lead, though. And how does the West Brom player still have the ball there? Rowe and Nunez both almost stealing it away. And come on, ref. Every time Ballo gets the ball. Is this a sending off? It's not. It's Yukoshlu. Thought that might be Alfie Moe again. Johnny Rowe. Can he beat his man like Marius Wolf did on the opposite side? Yes, he can. He can't find Borja Science at the back post, though. I feel a goal is coming. I feel a goal is coming. Been the better side in the second half by far. And what a good challenge. Josh Sargent. Johnny Rowe again stretching West Brom. Josh Sargent steals it away. And, of course, the West Brom man is able to tackle through the back of Josh Sargent. When I'm holding left trigger to try and shield, it does absolutely nothing. When the CPU do it, they're absolutely impenetrable. Good challenge, Marius Wolf. Couldn't quite release the ball to Borja Science up the line there. Grant Hanley finds Harry Toffolo. Hanley once more. Tiano Ballo. He's looked pretty bright and dangerous since coming on. And he finds Johnny Rowe on this left-hand side. Again trying to beat his man. Again trying to find a Norwich City shirt in the box. Again, all he can find is the waiting arms of the West Brom goalkeeper. A couple of poor deliveries from Johnny Rowe down that left-hand side. He does only have a three-star weak foot, to be fair. And we are asking him to cross the ball on his left. So, potentially we make a change and bring Christian Fasnacht on on the right-hand side and we move Borja Sainz back out to the left. I think that will probably be the next change that we make. Marius Wolf, though. Josh Sargent. Takes up a nice position. Adam Ida makes a good run. I didn't quite put enough on that. It was the perfect run from Adam Ida. Just trying to loft the ball in behind for him to run onto. I just didn't put enough on it. Borja Sainz gets there. Josh Sargent, another really good run in behind. Same goes for Adam Ida. Dealt with by Furlong. Bit too much on the cross that time from Josh Sargent. Good defensive work from Harry Toffolo just to hold up the West Brom counter-attack. Good tracking back from Josh Sargent as well. Because that was a dangerous run from the West Brom man. Come on, let's get this ball back. Let's get this ball back and get it back up into the West Brom half. That's where we've spent most of this second half. Chambers clears away. Eden nods it on towards Sargent. I just wanted to take that down, but... The West Brom man was coming in pretty hot. And I didn't think we'd have the time in the end. Good challenge. Headed clear. Good touch from Adam Eda. Johnny Rowe up ahead of him. And he is onside. And Johnny Rowe is in behind. Who's that on the edge of the box? It was Nunez. Couldn't really decide on an option there. Whether to just try and cross in and find Josh Sargent. Whether to pull it back for Marcelino Nunez, whether to try and cut inside with Johnny Rowe in the end. Didn't really do any of those three things. Good challenge, Wolf. Really open game now. Marius Wolf just driving forward. Adam Eder at the back post. Is he onside? Heads into the far corner. Linesman's flag stays down. And two minutes from time, Adam Eder may well have won it. The Norwich City fans go absolutely wild. Johannes Thorup is there celebrating with the team. Somebody is perpendicular. 
on the shoulders of the huddle. And I was certain the offside flag was going to go up. It must have just been... Adam Eder must just have been behind Marius Wolf Because he was certainly in front of the last defender. And what a header that is. Tucks it just inside the post. So three changes for Johannes Thorup. Josh Sargent leaves the field, as does Johnny Rowe. Christian Fasnacht is on. Shane Duffy is on. Jacob Sorensen is also on. I don't remember the third player we took off. But I'm not too fussed about trying to work out who it is. I need to be locked in for these last couple of minutes of the game. Because we have a, a single goal lead to defend. And just a couple of minutes left to defend it. We have dropped into a 5-4-1 as well. Our ultra defensive formation to try and protect this lead. And we are currently forcing the ball backwards rather than forwards for West Bromwich Albion, which is exactly what we want to see. Three minutes of stoppage time have been announced. And we are deep into the third. And there could be one final opportunity here for West Brom. Surely the whistle is going to go and it does. And what a turnaround at half time for Norwich City. What an adjustment from Johannes Storop at half time as well. We built a, a pretty comprehensive tactical game plan heading into the game. But games don't always play out as you anticipate. And that was exactly the case here today. But the best managers are ones that are able to adapt their tactics on the fly. And again, that's exactly what happened here today. And we completely turned the game around in the second half and we come away with an all important three points. Shout out to the viewer in the comments section as well who suggested playing both Adam Eder and Josh Sargent up front together. Certainly paid off in that particular game. Maybe we'll be looking to do that a little more often going forward. Ada will have to settle for a place on the bench again here though as we take on Cardiff City in our second game of the episode. Back to the double pivot for this one. Nunez and McLean will form that partnership. Ballo starts in the number 10 just ahead of him. Sainz on the left this time. Rowe on the right and a familiar back four. Sargent and Steele maintain their places as well. And it's a second straight 2-1 victory again. The opposition take the lead, this time through Colwell in just the sixth minute for Cardiff City. Nunez equalises just four minutes later though, and it's Josh Sargent this time who grabs the winner. Just four minutes from time, Cardiff did get a penalty 88 minutes into the game, but Ramsey ended up missing it. So we're leaving it late, but we are grinding out results, and Johannes Thorup goes with an almost unchanged 11 for the next match against Bristol City. Just Christian Fasnacht coming in for Johnny Rowe on the right-hand side. And that is an unexpected result, to say the least. We lose 2-0 to Bristol City. Really disappointing. And speaking of disappointment, there are some really interesting players in our youth scout reports that I don't want to miss out on. I've been trying to scout them further to narrow their potential and increase our chances of being able to sign them. But I'm starting to worry that we're going to miss out to other teams. Some of these players like Ollie Wilson and Noah Thomas do still have a potential too high for us to be able to sign, but we are guaranteed to sign some of these players like Hugh Hunt. Hugh Hunt is a center back with just a 59 to 83 potential range, but at 725,000, he should be on the higher end of that 48 to 66 overall range. And with only an average of 71 in terms of his, his potential, we are 100% likely to sign him. So we'll go ahead and add Hugh Hunt. He is one of six English players that we are able to sign on this particular scouting trip. Ronnie Middleton is another player I would be interested in. 75 to 89 potential, just a 240,000 valuation at this stage. But with an average potential of 82, we have just a 30% chance to sign him. So a bit of a long shot on this particular occasion. And unfortunately, we do fail. So we will have to reject Ronnie Middleton. Fortunately, though, I'm far more interested in Bobby Parker. A 72 to 94 potential, 51 to 69 overall. 
and a 525,000 valuation. He is 17, so would be eligible to be promoted to the first team immediately. 64 to 74 pace, 69 to 79 physical, a 510 defender. So we would probably be playing him right back. And Jack Stacey is leaving the club in January with an 83 average potential, though we have even less of a chance of signing him, just 20%. And we do finally hit on one of these youth prospects, just a 20% chance. But I mean, one in five isn't bad and it does come back as success. I think that's the first long shot youth prospect that I've actually had success on with Buzzco's signing calculator. So we will be able to sign Bobby Parker. He's a really exciting signing. Bobby Marsh is the only other player here that we could sign, but we would only have a 10% chance of signing him. I don't want to push my luck too much. Ollie Wilson, Bradley Poole, and Noah Thomas, we will continue to scout. In terms of Danish prospects, Frey Jensen actually looks pretty similar to Bobby Parker. So we might roll the dice on him as well. An 84 average potential, so only a 10% chance of signing this particular prospect. We have also signed two Danish prospects already. And we only have the six to sign. So four remaining, one of whom is not going to be Frey Jensen. We will have a look at Nikolai Anderson, though, just a 75 average potential. So we are guaranteed to be able to sign him. The last player I will try to sign is Amar Frederiksen, 74 to 88 potential. That gives him an average potential of 82 and gives us a 30% chance of signing him. So again, something of a long shot. And again, we do fail. And then finally, in terms of prospects from the US, there are three that we're going to try and sign now, each of which we are going to have a fairly remote chance of signing. But I like our chances to get at least one. Christian Ward has a 74 to 94 potential range and can play across midfield. We are least likely to be able to sign him, though, with just a 10% chance to sign. And indeed, we do fail on Christian Ward. Anthony Smith looks to be a little bit more versatile. We are marginally more likely to hit on him with a 20% chance to sign. But we do hit on a long shot again. Anthony Smith is going to be able to join the Youth Academy against the odds. And finally, Ethan Nelson. He has the lowest potential range of the bunch at just an average of 82, which gives us a little under a 1 in 3 chance. And that one in three hits back to back long shots join our youth academy. That's going to be huge. So Smith and Nelson are both very low overall, just 45 and 49, but they do have excellent potential ranges. Nelson is a right back with two to four play styles, excellent pace and physical attributes right out of the gate. Smith can play across the back line, but he's just 5'9, 154. So again, he would likely be a right back. High defensive work rate, one to four play styles, 70 pace and 65 dribbling. Really poor defensive attributes. So maybe we would look to move him forward to more of a, a, a wide forward position. Bobby Parker was probably the best of the prospects that we managed to sign there. Is currently down as a centre back, but again, just 5'10", 154. So we would undoubtedly move him to right back. 67 pace, 75 physical at just 17 years of age. Low medium work rates isn't great, but one to four play styles. Zero to three play styles for Damian Christensen. A left or right back. He is left footed and has just a three star weak foot, though. High, high work rates right out of the gate. Zero to three play styles. The highest overall that we signed in this particular round of signings was Hugh Hunt. He has one to three play styles, a four star weak foot, can play CDM or centre back. So at 6'5, 178. Potentially, he would be um, a candidate to move to centre-back to play as something of a, a ball-playing centre-back. And then finally, Nikolai Anderson, just one to two play styles, low, medium work rates. None of the attributes really jump out at me. 67 to 83 potential. It looks to be a fine addition, but nothing special at 55 overall. So we have seven slots in our Youth Academy currently filled, which means we have seven remaining. And with the possibility of promoting up to six players to the first team this season, I think we could see one or two of those players feature before the end of the season. But now, though, we have three more games to get to in today's episode, starting with highlights of our matchup against Hull City at Carrow Road. Hull City are having a very good season. They find themselves in fourth position. They are, however, just a point ahead of us. So I feel like I say it almost ahead of every single game at the moment, but these three points up for grabs could be very, very important 
come the end of the season, the playoff teams are step starting to separate themselves from the pack a little bit. And we need to make sure that we're not only able to keep up with those playoff teams, but that we are able to establish ourselves as one of them come the end of the season. So Hannes Thorup has gone with his 4-2-3-1 formation today, but there are several changes to the starting 11. Jose Cordoba comes into the back four. Marcelino Nunez pairs with Liam Gibbs today. And Adam Eder gets a rare start up front. I have no idea how Hull City have found themselves in fourth place in the table. They were absolutely awful in this game. We absolutely destroyed them. On the front foot early, Marcelino Nunez with a volley inside the box. This was a let off for Hull City. Adam Eder didn't let them off five minutes later though. Marcelino Nunez put the corner in. Adam Eder rose highest in the penalty area. An absolutely thundering header straight down the middle of the goal. But far too much pace on it for the goalkeeper to do anything about it. Well, Har Sainz continues to look good down the left-hand side. He cut in onto his right foot and forced a good save from the Hull City goalkeeper. One of the few that he would actually be able to make today. And despite our first half dominance, we would only manage the single goal in the first half. Johnny Rowe with a chance to double our lead shortly before half time, but it was a high level of difficulty on the finish and it ended up just hitting the side netting. We took the handbrake off in the second half, though. Just two minutes into the second period, Harry Toffolo found Adam Eder in the penalty area. He took it down beautifully on his chest, finished first time with the left foot in a way that we've seen Josh Sargent do a couple of times this season. And from there, we just built even further into the game. Borja Sainz again cutting in off the left-hand side onto his right foot. This time, though, the whole City defenders were scared of the shot. That opened up the space for Kenny McLean to run in behind, and he made up for his poor performance against West Brom with a goal of his own. And with two goals to his name already, it looked as though Adam Eder might be able to grab a hat-trick as Christian Fasnacht pulled the ball back to him inside the penalty area. Probably his easiest chance of the game. He didn't even manage to get it on target. But just three minutes later, Adam Eder would have his third goal of the game. It was a good initial save from the Hull City keeper from Jacob Sorensen's header. Fortunately, though, the rebound fell right to Adam Eder. It was a narrow angle, to be fair, a decent enough finish but ultimately an open goal. Hull City did grab a goal back into injury time in the second half, but it would only be a consolation. 4-1, the final score. So Adam Eder comes on and scores the winner against West Brom. He grabs a hat trick in a rare start here against Hull City. He's starting to look really good. We said earlier in the season, if he can improve his technical side of the game, improve his mental side of the game, become a bit more of an intelligent striker, he could be an absolute weapon. And he has proven that to be the case here so far in today's episodes with such a quick turnaround between Hull and our next matchup against Plymouth however Josh Sargent has returned to the starting 11 Duffy and Hanley each come back into the side as well Callum Chambers drop into the bench Kenny McLean returns to midfield and Onel Hernandez gets a rare start on the left hand side and maybe Ernel Hernandez is another backup who needs to play more minutes because he got on the score sheet just four minutes into the game. Josh Sargent's header from close range being parried away, but Hernandez was sharpest. He tapped in the rebound. And we controlled this game much the same way as we did the game against Hull City. Harry Toffolo this time lifted the ball into Josh Sargent, took it down really nicely on his chest on the edge of the box and laid it off to Johnny Rowe. His left-footed shot was narrowly wide. Johnny Rowe had another opportunity about 18 minutes into the game, this time cutting in off the right-hand side onto his left foot. And perhaps we need to get him on a development plan to train that weaker foot because it is currently a weakness in his game. And unfortunately, despite dominating, the first half was a game of missed chances. Tiano Ballo this time putting the ball narrowly past the Plymouth goal. Marcelino Nunez too appeared on the edge of the box, took a touch to get the ball out of his feet and then tried to curl it into that far corner. But again, we could not get the attempt on target. Fortunately though, just after half time, we would double our lead. Johnny Rowe and Josh Sargent linking up nicely and Sargent finished for what is his 14th goal of the season potentially. And in keeping with the theme of the episode, Ashley Barnes even came on off the bench and grabbed the goal late on. So we've had Adam Eder, we've had Erno Hernandez, we've had Ashley Barnes, several backups playing their part for us this season. And it is 14 goals in 21 games for Josh Sargent. Ante Budimir of Luton Town still tops the goal scoring charts, but he hasn't actually scored since we last checked in. And with only a goal to go to achieve Josh Sargent's player target, and with Grant Hanley departing the club in January, it very much looks like Sargent is going to be around next season 
and he's going to be wearing the captain's armband we are going to need sergeant in fine form again if we are going to round out the episode with another win against sunderland just two changes to the starting 11 callum chambers comes back into center back and borja science returns on the left hand side and we do indeed come away with another three points to round out a fantastic month johnny Rowe this time getting on the score sheet first followed by borja science unfortunately callum chambers was injured just before half time but shane duffy came on and grabbed a third goal about 70 minutes into the game sunderland grabbed a consolation late on but we did hang on and grab all three points so that means five wins out of six games in the month of december gives us 15 points in total for the month an incredible tally and those 15 points see us rise all the way to second position in the championship so for the first time this season we occupy one of those automatic promotion places there was a disappointing result against bristol city in amongst those six games and the only other disappointment for this episode is that callum chambers has torn his groin and will be out for three months so with the loss not only of Hanley but now also Chambers we really are going to have to bring in some cover at centre back in January. So we'll look to secure an arrival when the transfer window opens in just a couple of days time. We also have six games to get to in January. We have an FA Cup game against Peterborough and then return legs against five different championship clubs Sheffield Wednesday, Preston, West Bromwich Albion, Swansea and Burnley. So we have an automatic promotion place for the first time in the series and we're going to have to put up some serious points in our upcoming games if we don't want to give it up already. So we'll look to do that in the next episode. I hope to see you there. Take it easy.